Next on the Broadway show, it's the movie musical event of the year. We're chatting with one of the stars of Steven Spielberg's West Side Story, David Alvarez. Plus, change is gonna come. It's the unbelievable revival of Carolina Change, and we're talking to Sharon D. Clark, and we like Ike, sometimes, but we really like the Tony nominee who plays Ike Turner on Broadway. We're hanging out with Daniel J. Watts. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. The Broadway Show is back with another stellar episode. I'm Tamsin Fidel. It's happening tonight. I want the West Side locked down. So this is the most anticipated movie musical event of the year. Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story. Paul got to know one of the stars, David Alvarez. Thanks, Tamsin. David Alvarez dazzled Broadway as one of the young leads of Billy Elliot, winning a Tony Award at the age of 15. Since then, more ballet, more Broadway, the Army, college, and now a star turn as Bernardo in Steven Spielberg's reboot of West Side Story. I found out more when I met up with him at Time Hotel. What were you doing with my Bernardo, sister? No, no. Your brother has something to say to you. I apologize for behaving last night like, like a gangster. Steven Spielberg has made a big, splashy, brand new movie version of West Side Story. You're Bernardo, one of my favorite characters. How does it feel to be right on the cusp of like the world getting this movie? I mean, I'm so excited because we all worked so hard to, to bring this to life. And I think everyone brought so much um, talent and unique abilities to this to bring it to life and you know share a new a new version of this story a new perspective on this story talk about the filming because you were filming on the streets of New York what was it like to actually get in those costumes start dancing and tell that story I mean it's honestly I when I was behind the camera and I saw, you know, Steven and everyone working so closely together. I just couldn't believe that I was in the middle of one of the greatest directors of all time. You know, I've watched his movies when I was a kid and I always dreamt of, oh, imagine if I ever did a movie like that. And what were some Spielberg movies that like? Oh, that a lot E.T., yeah. um, Jaws, Jurassic Park. So Spielberg meant a lot. Um, yeah, he meant so much to me and finally being there and being surrounded by his team I, I, I felt like everyone had so much passion and want to be there that the energy there was just incredible. And like, I just couldn't believe it. You really arrived at Billy Elliot when you were a kid from the ballet world. Since you didn't necessarily arrive on Broadway as like someone who dreamt of being in a Broadway musical, did the movie West Side Story uh, mean anything to you, the original? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember when I was about 13 years old, um, I saw West Side Story on Broadway and I just remember having this feeling that one day maybe I'll be able to do a show like this. And it's crazy that, you know, 10 years later, I'm not only doing the show, I'm doing the movie for it. So it's just, it's crazy. You've actually seen the movie. I'm very jealous of your brain because you can actually picture what it looks like in, <laughs> in your brain. You've seen it. What are audiences in for? What did you really love about the finished product? I think one of the things I loved the most about it was how powerful the message was. The message of um, love and not giving in to fear and hatred, uh, and that message is so strong in the movie. And I, I'm really happy that that's what I think the audience is going to take from it. And you got to work with Ariana DeBose, Broadway's Ariana DeBose, yeah. play is your Anita. But did you guys have an immediate chemistry? Oh, absolutely. I think from the callback, we both felt this incredible chemistry, and I think it's because we're kind of polar opposites and we balance each other out and I think working with her was just an incredible experience. Um, she, she brought me up and we, we got the best out of each other out. There are actually two Tony winners in West Side Story, the new movie. It's not just you because <laughs> yeah. uh, Rita Moreno <laughs> yeah. is also in the film. What was it like getting to know her? I mean I remember looking at Rita and talking with her and just thinking this woman is a master in her craft. She knows what she's doing. And when you see this movie, you're gonna realize how truly incredible she is. And I think she inspired not only me, but the entire cast every day when we were there. You also enrolled in the Army yeah. af after high school. A lot of performers would look at that and go like, wait, how, what? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about sort of <laughs> what that experience, how it's maybe helped you in the bigger picture of life and your career? Yeah, I think 
to be an actor or just to create or be an artist in whatever you're doing, it's good to kind of understand the struggles that everyone goes through in life so that you can use some of that to create whatever it is that you want to create. So for me, it was kind of a way to step out of this um, bubble so that I could see the world for what it is and I could come back and share my experiences. Best supporting actress, Rita Marino, and she's wide-eyed over the whole thing. I can't believe it! Stage and screen icon Rita Moreno became the first Latina to win the Best Supporting Actress Oscar for her portrayal as Anita in the 1961 West Side Story film. Now, 50 years later, she's back on the big screen in Steven Spielberg's retelling. Last time I talked to Rita, I asked her how it feels. Can you believe it? <laughs> what are your thoughts about it? What, what, talk about a renaissance. Holy mackerel, it's astonishing. It's crazy. <laughs> I so wish my mom were here. I re I've missed her so much with all of this wonderful stuff that has happened. And, and, and um, I wish my husband were here. He would be so proud because he was always so hurt on my behalf that I was ignored for so many years. Daniel J. Watts is a Broadway star on the rise, fresh off a Tony nomination for his work in Tina, the Tina Turner musical. Charlie's here with the story. Thanks, Samson. Daniel J. Watts returns to his Tony-nominated role as Ike Turner. We sat down here at the Renaissance Hotel to talk about the fan favorite show and so much more. So, Daniel, you just celebrated somewhat of an anniversary, 15 years on Broadway. Sheesh, yes. You debuted in The Color Purple 15 years ago. Yeah. Could that person have ever imagined you'd be where you are today? Yes and no. The first answer is no, right? And then there's a subtle underneath, like, yeah, of course, this is what I came here for. You know, it, it, it's both. But, you know, it, it, the way and the magnitude in which it all happened, uh, I could not have imagined it. So, of course, we know you play Ike in the musical Tina. Can you kind of talk about that role and what attracted you to it initially? Oh man, Ike Turner is uh, is a hurt person. I think that's what attracted me to it. When I, I hadn't thought about Ike Turner ever since watching What's Love Got To Do With It. And knowing that Adrian was doing the show in London and finding out that my name had been thrown in the hat uh, to audition for it, I just did a deep dive of who he was. What, what was I missing? I resonated with him in terms of like, there is an artist in here who is trying to deal with a lot of things and sometimes art isn't enough and what happens when art isn't enough. And I felt that I had something interesting to bring to the role, uh, something sensitive to bring to the role. And um, that, that challenge to maybe help people look at not only Ike, but any individual like that differently with just a little bit more color, a little more, no, more nuance is what I wanted to do. It's quite the heavy role. How do you mentally prepare for it? And then how do you take that off when you leave? I, I, I take it off. You know, I didn't know how to do that before. Uh, before the pandemic, I was very much wearing it everywhere. And it's, you know, I think that's just part of the process. And now I know, I, I know what the depths are. <laughs> I know what is too deep and I can just put it on long enough to tell the story. And then I take a shower after the show, you know, just a nice, long, hot, just people outside, hey, I'm outside. I'm like, I'll see you when I get done taking this off, you know, um, which I, I also realize the importance of that. I've always taken pride in being the kind of artist that's always making moves. I know that you paint with your feet. <laughs> Is that a part of your therapy for this particular role and helping you afterwards, or is that just something that you do for fun? I think it became that. I think uh, for a lot of people, the pandemic hit them right away. It didn't really hit me until September, and that was when I started painting. And I finally had this other thing to kind of release and realizing that taking on Ike was a part of it. You know, um, I talk about it in my TED talk, you know, I didn't know whose trauma was whose. I didn't know whose trauma was Hughes. You know, what colors were mine and what colors were Ike's. Uh, so painting has now become a thing. It's very therapeutic and I haven't been able to paint as much because I don't have as much time as I had before, but I've, you know, I've, I started painting again literally last week and it's like, there you are, okay. <laughs> Hugh Jackman just about ready to return to Broadway in The Music Man, the revival starring two Tony winners, Jackman and his co-star Sutton Foster. The Music Man is the story of what happens when con man Harold Hill arrives in River City only to fall in love with a town librarian. Performances begin December 20th. Opening night is set for February.
It's Broadway's must-see musical of the moment, the electrifying revival of Carolina Change. This month, the company releasing its stunning cast recording. They're led by Olivier Award winner Sharon D. Clark. Paul Wontorek spoke with the star of Carolina Change. That's right, Tamsin. British stage and TV star Sharon D. Clark may not be a household name on this side of the Atlantic yet, but her powerful performance in Carolina Change is set to change that. We sat down at the Time Hotel to find out more about the role that finally brought her to Broadway. You have three Olivier Awards. You, you're a very, you have a very healthy British career, I mean, over across the Atlantic. But this is your actual Broadway Yes, debut. at this time in my life, I'm having a debut and it's wonderful to be having firsts. Yeah. You know what I mean, it's, it's great and I'm, I'm just so overjoyed to be here and to bring the show back to its home in New York and share the story and tell the experience and just have fun in this wonderful city. Caroline is a, a housekeeper in the South for a Jewish family. We, we meet her at her washing machine. All, all the appliances uh, sing to her uh, and the moon and it's sort of magical in it's that magical. way. It's magical. It seems like a, quite a small show and quite basic but we do have these fantastic elements of a singing moon and a washing machine who is supportive and fresh and gives her cool air when she's frying in the basement and her radio who are her sanctuary, her, her link to the outside world but who are also kind of her conscience and bring her up and stuff and hold up the mirror and try to get her to face stuff that she doesn't want to deal with. And then you've got her dryer who is her nemesis, you know, the minute the dryer goes on in the basement, there aren't any windows, it's hot as hell. She gets into a darker place, her thoughts get more oppressive, more darker, and the dryer just brings out that side of her. So you have what is kind of like a mundane situation given fantastical heights in a way. When you're living with a role, and you've been sort of living with her for a while now, what's it been like to sort of uh, live with this woman for all this time? It's, it's wonderful because you get a chance to, to keep refining her, keep mining her, keep yeah. finding new things. And with each cast and each slight different cast changes we had in London, different people give you different things. And so you are able to react in a different way and find different things for yourself so it keeps it fresh for you, for me. So I've, I've been loving it. I've been loving the journey. There's still a whole lot more to talk about on this edition of The Broadway Show. Coming up, he's the new Prince of Broadway. You're going to get to know Ro Hartramp. The Broadway Show is back in just a sec. Ro Hartramp is the Prince of Broadway. Prince Charles in the musical Diana, a star on the rise for sure. And that's why he's this week's Fresh Face. My name is Ro Hartramp. I play Prince Charles in Diana the Musical on Broadway. When I was a kid in Atlanta, I was uh, really rambunctious. And instead of uh, punishing me for that, my parents put me in a church choir, which led to the church musicals. And when I got on stage and would sort of step out of line and do something silly and I got a, a laugh response instead of a stern look. That really gave me the bug and I knew that's what I wanted to do forever. New York was and is and always will be the dream for me. I knew I wanted to go to New York like from the time I was in junior high school. As soon as I learned about NYU, I said that's where I want to go to college. I went to summer camp at NYU. I went to a theater school at NYU. I have been addicted to the energy of the streets of New York for as long as I can remember. It was always theater. Something about being in front of a live audience was so special to me. There's really nothing that compares to doing theater. And now that I'm on Broadway for the first time, I know that there's nothing that compares to a Broadway house. Making my Broadway debut feels indescribable. It's everything I've ever wanted and it doesn't feel the way that I thought it would. It's in so many ways better. It's a really special uh, family community that is uh, exactly what I hoped Broadway would feel like. Stepping into the show now in 2021 is a completely different experience than it was in March of 2020. I think I was really overwhelmed by the moment when we were ramping up to our debut in March of 2020. I was anxious, I was nervous, I wasn't really settled. And having a year and a half, 600 days to sit with myself has helped me become almost a new person. So coming back to this show and realizing what a gift it is 
and how special it is to not only be on Broadway, but, but to be doing live theater in general. Um, it's a whole new show and it's a whole new experience. One thing I learned about Prince Charles that I wasn't expecting is about his humanity. You know, what a good person he is at his core. And I think that having maybe some of the worst years of his life play out so openly in the media gives us a certain impression of him. It's part of my job to strip away those preconceived notions and try and find the human being at the center of this character. I don't know much about living in a palace or having a staff in that way, but you know, I know what it feels like to fall in love with someone. I know what it feels like to have a relationship not work out. I know what it feels like to have pressure from your family and, and duties that you have to follow through on and pressure of living up to expectations. Coming in to my first show and having this much responsibility is something that I always wanted. It's the dream. Sierra Bogus and Julian Ovenden have teamed up on a new album called Together at a Distance. Paul's here with more. Hi, Paul. That's right, Tamsin. When COVID kept people cooped up, these two longtime friends decided to collaborate. We sat down at the Civilian Hotel to talk about the project and their sweet friendship. It's important to find someone that you like to sing with. That's correct. It? And what, so what's so great about each other? It's funny because as we were making this record, he would sit, we, we would often, we would switch off, but a lot of times he would send his vocal and then I would match. And it's like, he's so good. He truly is one of the best voice and best male voices that anybody has ever heard. And it's like, it's such a joy to work with him too because I trust his musicianship and that's also really rare. I feel like it's like Jules is just another um, instrument in the orchestra. It's like how he vocalizes is like, it's just like people will see that when they watch him sing and also I just feel like, and, and I, it's how I hear it too. So it's just like, it's a gift. Okay, so when COVID-19 hit, everyone kind of froze, didn't really know what to do. At what point did this actually, the, the idea of this start brewing? I think as actors or artists or any kind of performers, there was, you know, the, the, the first of the few months were like, oh, it's actually quite nice to have a rest or let's just enjoy being at home with a family or whatever. And then that comes a time where it's like, I need to do something. I need yeah. to get out. I need to express outlet, myself. A creative outlet. Be, yes. Yeah, be creative. And we kind of came upon this idea just really as a kind of a way of passing the time because I don't have any skills in sort of music production. So we kind of assembled my son, who's 11 at the time, gave me some hints on garage band or is it garage band here. Garage band garage here, band. Julian. Garage so band. He helped me with that. Sierra, we got a, a mic in Sierra's shoe closet. Yep. And we made a video, we made us a, like an accompanying video to each to each song. Won't you answer the fervent prayer of a stranger in paradise? Don't send me in dark despair from all that I hunger for. The first song we recorded together was Stranger in Paradise, which is one of the songs that we've sung together at, at Royal Albert Hall. Um, and so we started with that and we thought like, what can we do during it? And so I'm vacuuming and- I'm ironing. Yeah. <laughs> But then we went on to do cooking, we yeah. did like something with our pet, we did a love story with our pets, I've got a dog, I've right. got two cats, yep. there's a whole kind of threesome, animal threesome kind yep. of thing, situation going on. It was on. very intense, yeah. I mean, it's all the things that I swore I would never do. <laughs> but <laughs> then, but, but then, then. then. With a pandemic, <laughs> I'm like making YouTube videos. Yep. What am I doing? Yep. When you're in New York, you've got to get down to the West Village. It is one of the most charming neighborhoods there is, and that includes a great little venue called the Cherry Lane Theater. And right now, that is where comedian Alex Edelman is performing his solo show. It's called Just For Us. Take a look. I went to New York University, and I learned to be a comedian in that neighborhood by watching. I would go to the cellar uh, or the Village Underground or the Village Lantern. Just the auspices of this show, to be able to do it, you know, in the West Village, one of the great like comedy neighborhoods on the planet, and to do it at the Cherry Lane Theater, which is, a, you know, a theater that I revere. Just like a dream come true. It's a stand-up show slash solo show. It's about like Jewish identity in the 21st century. And specifically, it's about this uh, meeting of like white nationalists that I went to in uh, like, 
and a 2017, beginning of 2018. When it basically went into a room with a bunch of people talking about white identity and after about an hour and a half, someone's like, I'm sorry, but this guy's a Jew. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a Jew. And they were like, who invited you? And I'm like, well, I saw something on the internet. And then they were like, you know, that that's the show basically. You know, I've just kind of ruined the show actually, if I'm being honest, that's the, the, it's a show about me going to a meeting of white nationalists and spoiler alert, they don't kill me at the end of it. And that's gonna do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.